Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Tuesday, December the 18th, 2018. It's 8 a.m. New York time, 5 a.m. Los Angeles time, 1 p.m. in London, and in Sydney, Australia, it's 12 midnight, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us here today for your daily dose of happy. We are off and running with our continuation of Neville Goddard. We're up to, Cindy and I were amazed. We're up to chapter 22. 22 in the power of awareness. 22 out of 27 chapters. We're going to finish this one this week, I think, Cindy, at the rate we're going. We could do that. We just might do that. I wow. Think, I think it's possible, which would be amazing. I, I, maybe we call it like a, a, a Christmas gift, you know? <laughs> we finished the book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. That would be great. Yeah. I'm enjoying it, though. It could go on forever because I'm that's enjoying quite possible. it. Uh, yeah. That's how I always feel about Neville books. I, I even have a friend that she's a big Neville fan like I am, and she said that she doesn't finish. She said, I, I'm leaving a few Neville books where I haven't read them because I don't want to. I don't want to run out. Like, don't want to spoil it. <laughs> Got to get your daily dose of Neville in addition to your daily dose of happy. So, yeah. That's right. Good. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, once again, we are, of course, live streaming to uh, Facebook's Law of Attraction Changed My Life group, in addition to recording the podcast for our podcast listeners. And if you are listening to the live stream, we would invite you to not only uh, listen in, but also add your questions, not just about Neville, but about anything related to the Law of Attraction, because that's one of the things we love to do most, answer questions and help people get over the hump or figure out what's what's not going right or how to fix things or whatever, because that's what we do. <laughs> so please feel free right, to put how the, to tell a new story. how to tell a new story. That's it. Yeah. So feel free and, and take the time to put questions into the comments section um, where you're watching this uh, live stream and we'll be glad to address them as we are moving along. Um, also, I wanted to let people know we started something last night. That's a little bit new. Um, as many people now know, Patty Framo has decided to move on to other activities in her life, and we wish her well. I'm going to miss her terribly because I love doing shows with her. But uh, we have a new person who has stepped into her shoes, so to speak. Shelly Epperly is uh, a, a housewife, actually, from the northwestern part of the United States. And uh, we had our first show last night. And I say last night because on Mondays, Mondays only, Instead of doing the second podcast at 4 p.m. New York time, we're now going to do it at 8 p.m. New York time. The idea being to try to get uh, more outreach to people who live in the U.S. So particularly if you're a U.S. resident and uh, you found that our earlier times, mornings or afternoons, just didn't work for you, but evenings work better, then you want to be tuning in Monday evenings going forward from now on because those are going to be the days for you to come in and ask the live tra- questions and hear the live stream in in the uh, Facebook Law of Attraction Change My Life group. And uh, we're hopeful, Cindy, that it, it's going to provide uh, like a new wow. way for people to, to tune in. I, I've been thinking for the longest time that we needed to have an evening show. We even tried one. Tom Wells and I tried one, you'll remember, last spring on Tuesday Sunday evenings. Yeah. Well, we do all the right. Sunday night, but Tom, Tom and I also tried a Tuesday night one. Um, the problem was we just didn't have enough outreach yet to, uh, for people to find it, I think. Um, but now that we have uh, the outreach through the Facebook group, I'm thinking this might be a good time to try it again and see what happens. So please tune in Monday nights to listen to, uh, Shelly and I, as we answer questions and take all comers and maybe even come up with some topics we haven't come up with yet. You never really (laughs) know. (laughs) Well, it's always a different show when we've got participants and people joining in the conversation even if it's the same topic that we've done before because you know that added bonus of having people ask what their questions are changes everything does oh yeah yeah no doubt about it because it provides an energy too because i mean you and i for instance doing a show together we have a certain energy and it's a good energy but when you bring other people into it the energy increases it changes it oh yeah it takes on new forms yeah it's really really good stuff so, and power of awareness, like we said, we're in uh, chapter 22, so I'm going to get out the, the book and I'm, let's see, where's my decoder ring? Do you have your decoder ring on? <laughs> I do. Oh, good. All right. Well, I then just, I'll, I'll I, let you wear it. <laughs> it's like my wedding ring. I just don't take it off. You don't take it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so you never know when you're going to run up against a, a Neville Passage. <laughs> 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 you can figure it out. <laughs> So let's see, we're up to 22, and uh, once again, as per normal for Neville, he starts off with a Bible verse. This one's 
fairly lengthy. He doesn't usually pick long ones. This is kind of unusual for him, isn't it? It is. Yeah. But I really like the title. Persistence, yes. Oh. Because that's the thing that I think we've discussed many times, but that we often hear, especially from people that have just found out about the law of attraction and mm. they're excited about it and then not much time goes by at all and they say, well, I tried it and it didn't work. Right, me. exactly. Yep. And I think that that's because of a lack of persistence. And so I'm happy to see Neville say persistence is important. But yes, he does start off with a very long, uh, long for him verse. And as usual, we will make our little uh, announcement about Neville and the Bible verses. Neville, he describes his own meaning of verses often after he uses them. And it's right. usually not what we think it would be. It's very esoteric. Um, he, he very much is not a literalist. Uh, so we'll just see what he has to say because who knows where he's going to go. But he says, uh, he starts with this verse from Luke that says, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So it's an interesting story where a man comes to his friend's house and says, look, I need some extra loaves of bread because I have a visitor. And the, the man at, of the house says, no, it's too late. Go away. I can't do this. I'm here. My kids are already tucked in. I, I can't do this for you right now. And the verse actually says, well, he's not going to do it because he's his friend, but he is eventually going to do it because the guy's not going to give up. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he's just going to keep knocking. And keep saying, come on, man, you got to do this for me. It's, it, I know it's late, but I have this need. Please do this for me. And finally, the guy's going to give in. It says, he will do it because of his importunity. He will rise and he will give him as many as he needs. So it's kind of funny. This sort of goes against um, a lot of things that I was taught about polite behavior as a child. Right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Pushing and pushing and <laughs> and keep asking and keep asking, but Neville's saying that's what we need to do. Neville it says it reminds me of before you get into the text. It reminds me of a story that comes out of Sudbury school circles. For those who aren't sure what Sudbury is, Sudbury is a model of education that basically puts the student in charge of everything. Uh, it's quite uh, radical for that reason, and. There's a story that comes out of the Sudbury uh, community, so to speak, about uh, a young lady who had just graduated from a Sudbury school, from actually from the original Sudbury school in um, Massachusetts near Boston. And she had a very clear idea, as happens so often with Sudbury kids. They know, they have a very good, very good idea of what it is they want to do when they leave school, much more so than uh, traditional school students tend to do. Um, and she had a very clear idea what she wanted to do. And she had heard from one of the staff members that there was a school in Connecticut, actually not far away from where Louise and I live. But actually, it's in the same town that Anne Marie lives in, um, called uh, Wesleyan University. And Wesleyan had just the perfect program for this girl. And uh, she went and checked it out with her mom. And, oh, absolutely, this is exactly what she wanted. So she went to the admissions office to apply. And the admissions counselor said, oh, I'm sorry, the deadline for application has already passed. You'll have to apply again next year. So Aww. the next day, the girl got on the phone and called the admissions office and said, hi, I want to come to your school. And the admissions officer said, well, sorry, it's like I said yesterday, the deadline has passed. You'll have to apply again next year. So the next day, the girl got on the phone and said, hi, I want to come to your school. <laughs> and the admissions officer said, well, it's like I said the last two days, you know, the, the deadline has passed. You'll have to apply again next year. This went on for about a month. Uh, every single day, she just kept calling and saying, I want to come to your school. I want to come to your school. And finally, the dean of admissions overheard a conversation that uh, she'd had with the admissions officer and said, what is that all about? 
And she said, well, you know, this girl wants to come to Wesleyan, but, uh, you know, unfortunately she contacted us after the deadline for application. And he says, get her in here. <laughs> Let's find out what's making this kid tick. And the, the, the officer said, well, you don't have any room left in your schedule. He says, oh, just, you know, put, put her in for 15 minutes. We'll just get her, squeeze her in for a 15-minute interview and we'll have a little conversation, find out what's going on. Well, the girl came in with her mother, went in for the 15-minute interview. 45 minutes later, the dean and the girl came out arm in arm. He had his, his arm around her shoulders. He walked her over to her mother and said, I hope your daughter decides to come here. She is exactly the kind of student we want to come to this school. And it's, the story is told as a way of demonstrating how Sudbury students are very, because of their, they're in control of their own education, they're, they're very strong-minded. They, they just don't let anything get in the way. They are persistent. And, and that's yes. what I was thinking about when, when you were writing, reading that uh, section from Luke. This girl just fitted to the T. Nothing was going to stop her. Nothing. Well, I'm so glad you told this story because so many times we read a verse like this and, you know, it, to me, it, it brings it to life to know an actual story that happened in our day and time. Right. Uh, that it, that's an example of, of this kind of persistence. So Absolutely. So that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how many people would have just given up, right? Oh, God, they yes. <laughs> they would wait till next year. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get into, we've, we've had your example of this verse, which is an actual, real-life, played-out, physical people involved story. Right. Now we're going to hear from Neville because he's going to give us something different, I bet. He says, there are three principal characters in this quotation, you and the two friends mentioned. The first friend is a desired state of consciousness. Oh. The second friend is a desire seeking fulfillment. Three is the symbol of wholeness, completion. Loaves symbolize substance. The shut door symbolizes the senses which separate the seen from the unseen. Children in bed means ideas that are dormant. Is the Neville Dakota ring going crazy right now? <laughs> it's beeping and there's light flashing <laughs> over here. Inability to rise means a desired state of consciousness cannot rise to you. You must rise to it. Importunity means demanding persistency, a kind of brazen impudence. Mm, good description. Ask, seek, and knock mean assuming the consciousness of already having what you desire. So he, he's got a lot of meaning packed Whoa, into this. Oh, boy, thing. huge metaphors. He says, thus the scripture tells you that you must persist in rising to assuming the consciousness of your wish already being fulfilled. The promise is definite that if you are shameless in your impudence in assuming that you already have that which your senses deny, it shall be given unto you. Your desire shall be attained. The Bible teaches the necessity of persistence by the use of many stories. When Jacob sought a blessing from the angel with whom he wrestled, he said, I will not let thee go except, thee bl except thou bless me. When the Shunammite sought the help of Elisha, she said, as the Lord lives and as thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. The same idea is expressed in another passage. And he spake a parable unto them that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was a city, a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest she weary me by her continual coming. <laughs> the basic truth underlying each of these stories is that desire springs from the awareness of ultimate attainment and that persistence in maintaining the consciousness of the desire already being fulfilled results in its fulfillment. It's not enough. To feel yourself into the state of the answered prayer. You must persist in that state. That is the reason for the injunction. Man ought always to pray and not to faint. Here, to pray means to give thanks for already having what you desire. Only persistency and the assumption of the wish fulfilled can cause those subtle changes in your mind which result in the desired change in your life. It matters not whether they be angels, Elisha, or reluctant judges. 
all must respond in harmony with your persistent assumption. When it appears that people other than yourself and your world do not act toward you as you would like, it is not due to reluctance on their part, but a lack of persistence in your assumption of your life already being as you want it to be. Your assumption to be effective cannot be a single isolated act. It must be a maintained attitude of the wish fulfilled. And then this is in brackets, this last paragraph, and I know we've talked before about a discrepancy between what I'm reading on the screen and what's in the uh, paperback book. Right, right. This is another one. Yep. So so at the end, after that um, sentence I just read, it says in brackets, and that maintained attitude that gets you there so that you think from your wish fulfilled instead of thinking about your wish is aided by assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled frequently. It is the frequency, not the length of time, that makes it natural. That to which you constantly return constitutes your truest self. Frequent occupancy of the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the secret of success. Okay. All right. So there's a lot to unpack here, I think. Yeah, a whole lot. <laughs> uh, but something that something that hit me is... Um, is that I've been practicing a certain vignette and yesterday I had a real struggle. I just, I don't know if I just didn't sleep well the night before or what happened, but mm. just yesterday I really had a struggle for most of the day of wow. just a sense of that voice in my head telling me that this thing hadn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Right. This thing that I've, become accustomed to assuming the feeling of it already being fulfilled in a very almost tangible way, the feeling of it. Um, I could sense it in the last couple of weeks, just beginning to harden into fact. And then all of a sudden I have this day ah. where, where it's like this voice is saying, you know, it continually reminding me all day. <laughs> that it's not the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's not how things are. And reading this this morning, I realized that that's the time when persistence is important. You know, it reminds me of the story that you told of the young girl that called the school over and over. Mm -hmm. And in your story, every time she called, she spoke to someone that answered the phone. And I think yesterday was a day I had where the phone just didn't get answered, right? <laughs> It wasn't even about me assuming the feeling. It's like it wasn't it wasn't even happening at all. So <laughs> there was no one. So so that tells me that actually it kind of tells me that I'm getting closer. Um, mm -hmm. But also that a reminder to myself that when we have those times where it's not as easy to assume the feeling, that's when we really have to sort of double down on it. That's true. And in fact, uh, the persistence chapter um, and the title persistence, uh, it struck me that it's really appropriate now that I think about it because I actually had, a, well, there's, there's two parts to a little story here I want to tell. First part is we've been having some conversations along the lines of, of, um, what it takes to create a vignette, what it creates to take, uh, to create an image in your mind. And we've talked about that quite a bit. One of the things I've mentioned to you and to others is that I've, all my life had trouble creating any kind of image in my mind. Um, they call it aphantasia now. And it's been quite a challenge, especially for somebody who wants to be a deliberate creator. I have learned that you can create without creating images in your mind, and that's reassuring to me. But I've always thought, boy, it would be really great if I could create images in my mind like other people can. Because when I found out other people actually do create images in their mind, they can see them, they can see the details. I saw, thought, wow, I want that. Why can't I have that? So that, that's that been part of the topic for conversation. The other part of it is that, um, let's see, where do I want to go with this? Uh, in, in my desire to create vignettes that I could see, I recognized that I was having trouble creating them because I was having trouble imagining them in my mind. So it occurred to me, well, why don't I just, you know, take kind of the vision board approach? Because you can actually see what you put onto a vision board. Except I wanted right. to go a step further. I wanted it to be video. I wanted to actually oh. see the motion, right? 
So right. now the vignette I was trying to create was one regarding the podcast, because I've mentioned a few times now, I want us to get up to the point where we have like 10,000 listeners every time that we put out a podcast episode. And toward that end, I wanted to be able to create a video, uh, you know, a little short video that would reinforce that, that would, that would be my vignette to go to. So I did some searching, and you know what I found? I found that somebody had t- deliberately created a video with the camera up on stage of an audience giving them a standing ovation. I thought, what a <laughs> cool video that is. So right. I said, and, and it was a pretty large crowd. I'd, I'd say probably the crowd was like somewhere between two and 4,000 people. So it was a good sized crowd. Um, and I figured, geez, I wonder if I can, what, what can I do to turn that into a video that I can use as my own personal vignette? So that's what I've actually been doing the last two days. And I completed it. And after I completed it, I turned it into a loop so that it would just keep playing over and over and over again with Yay, the very, with the very, I, the very definite idea of persistence, right? If I keep persisting in, in watching this video and getting excited like it was really happening and pretending this was my, actually my audience and so forth, you know, I would be persistently building up that emotion in myself and, as you said, turning it into a, a hardening in my mind so that ultimately it becomes real. And I've started to do that the last few days. I've started playing that, that video. Just before we uh, got together to start doing the podcast today, I was playing my video for about five minutes Yay. straight. Excellent. You know, so here we are now. We're talking about persistence. And I'm thinking, well, that's exactly what I was working on. I didn't even think of it as being persistence. But that's what it was that I, I wanted and needed. And I knew it. Because even as I've been playing the video for myself, I can get into the excitement of it. I can... Uh, you know, I, I can pretend like uh, I've just been introduced to the crowd. They're giving me a standing ovation. And yet in the midst of that, I can also hear the little doubts saying, yeah, but this is just, we just pretended this. This isn't real. <laughs> this, right. is, this, is, this is all just made up. And that's when I began to realize how important it is to have these vignettes so that I can keep playing them over and over again until I get to the point where that doubt stops creeping in. Because as that doubt stops creeping in, I think that's where the hardening takes place. Right, exactly. Right, where it becomes it be it becomes more real yes. than what is. Yes, exactly. Right, and when I say what is, I'm over here making you know air quotes. What <laughs> is because we use that phrase to say you know sometimes people will say, but this is how it is. That's right. Yeah. Anytime you hear yourself say that, this is kind of a rule that I know, is that anytime I hear myself say, well, that's just the way it is, oh, there's a big limitation there going on. Absolutely, (laughs) there is. Huge limitation. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't, we want to recognize that we are always in the process of creating, and it seems like this is what is, because we're just recreating the same thing over and over and over, moment by moment. Right. Uh, But things can shift in an instant. And when they start to really shift and out, you know, when we can create them in our environment, when we see evidence happening, that's generally when we've reached that point. It's kind of like the saturation point. There's so much thought going in that direction that it hardens into fact because Mm -hmm. we feel it. We believe it. We're no longer saying, but look over here at this evidence that it's not happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is big stuff. This is this is critically important. And I, I like the fact that he points out that it's not enough to just assume the feeling. You have to do it persistently. You have to do it in a way that is just consistently over and over again, hardening it. Just doing it once yeah. or twice isn't going to cut the mustard. No, definitely yeah. not. And that's one of the things that I recognize now is that I think I had – Prior to yesterday, I had a couple of days where I was really busy and I was kind of slacking off on mm-hmm. <laughs> on the persistence and sure. see what happened. I could see the snowball happening, of, right. the snowball of doubt, right? The snowball of little voices exactly. saying, yeah, that's, that's not happening. <laughs> um, but it is happening and I know it's happening. So persistence to the rescue. Thank you, Neville. And Shireen actually shared something a, a few minutes back that, that ties into this. She says, I'm trying to focus on what I want. And I am with my kids now, so I'm happy. God, I forgot how to be happy for a long time, and I forgot how to have hope again and time to enjoy being with my two kids and forget about my teeth and dentists, even a full-time job, one day at a time. Good observation. 
right? Because yeah, we get so hooked up, good. we get very caught up good. in all that stuff, and it's so important to redirect our attention. So, congratulations, Shireen, you're doing right. it. Very good. Yeah. Very good. And I love, I love when people um, bring up the fact that they've recognized that they feel hopeful again. Mm. Uh, like she said, hope again, and that's so important because when we lose hope, we really can't create much at that point. Right. Um, once we have our hope back and we start to feel hopeful again, then we can ditch hope uh, for faith. <laughs> yeah, because right? ultimately because what happens we is we, we end up having, once, once you start getting the, the uh, momentum going in the other direction, new reasons start coming to you. You know, new, new, um, new, new inspirations, if you will, that, oh, well, I didn't remember this particular reason for hope, but now it's coming to me again. Or this one is a brand new one. This is this new idea over here. And I hadn't thought of that, but now that I'm in a better feeling place, I'm receptive, receptive to receiving it. Before, I, I couldn't have even noticed that it was there. That's the kind of thing that happens. I think it does. It reminds me of when Abraham talks about a thought that's held for a certain amount of time, not mm -hmm. very long, but that it will start to generate more thoughts like it, right? Right, exactly. More agreeable thoughts to it, thoughts yep. that are in alignment with that first thought. And so, yeah, definitely. And at that point, you can really start amping up your faith because at that point, you're, you're beginning to know that it's possible. You're beginning to have a knowing that you're creating something instead of a hoping. Right. Right. Exactly. When, when someone says, well, I hope that, I hope it happens, um, there's not a whole lot of creative power there. No, Because not really. we're sort of giving all the power to some other place and just hoping. But we got to go beyond hope. But hope is crucial because if we oh, don't yeah. have hope, then, you know, that's a terrible place to be. I think we've all experienced it at one time or another, just feeling hopeless. Not but, a good feeling. So, Shereen, I'm glad that your hope is restored <laughs> Hooray! all right yeah. good stuff so then, we actually finished a chapter is there anything that we read that comes to mind that you want to you know look at before we move on or be probably before we do announcements i guess well i mean there was a lot of neville dakota ring going on there I, do, <laughs> yes. I, I wonder if we need to kind of review any of that because i mean he did review it which was good but it goes by pretty quickly you know, because as you, read, you realize, oh, my God, what was that? <laughs> what was the seventh one? You know, because <laughs> there's so many of them. Well, I think in this particular instance, most of these are directly related to the verse that he was speaking of. Right. Sometimes mm -hmm. he'll use uh, a definition that, you know, is going to be used over and over no matter what verse he's reading. Um, but this particular one talking about persistence. I think was pretty much just related to that one verse. So as he said, the first friend is a desired state of consciousness. The second friend is a desire seeking fulfillment. Three is the symbol of wholeness, completion. I think he's speaking of three friends. Because there's the friend from out of town. There's the friend that visits the other friend, right? So <laughs> <laughs> all, all three of those bring wholeness. So I think he's talking about here that we have to have, we did, we had a, um, a whole chapter, I think, called Desire, right? Right. So he's talking about the desired state of consciousness and how that desire seeks fulfillment. And then, of course, it has to come from somewhere. So we've got the, the persistence. I thought it was interesting that he says, um, he talks about children in bed and inability to rise and talks yeah. about a, a desired state of consciousness consciousness cannot rise to you you must rise to it mm, good point i think that's really interesting there yeah yeah it's, a, it's an unusual metaphor but it, it, it makes a great point that's for sure and by the way we because, have a, we have a couple of uh uh comments and a comment and a question actually well not so much a question we have a story actually and we have oh, a comment about somebody who's having a little bit of a challenge um, I'll tell the okay, story first. Deirdre, Deirdre shared a Neville story. She said, have you heard a Neville story about Neville being drafted into the army? He did not want to be there. So he imagined himself back at home with his wife and little baby. He put in an application to be released. It was denied. But Neville persisted in his imagination as he felt himself at home. He didn't bug his colonel about asking to go home. He just persisted in his desire. And one day, not long after entering the army, he was asleep when someone came to the barracks 
with the application he'd put in asking to be discharged, on which his colonel had written in bold letters, denied. Well, he was called to his colonel's office and was asked if he still wanted to go home. Yes, sir, he replied. The colonel gave many, many reasons that Neville should, Neville should stay, not the least of which was that the colonel wanted just the sort of man Neville was and didn't want to let him go. <laughs> after, giving, <laughs> after giving Neville so many reasons to stay, he asked again, Do you still want to go home? Yes, sir, Neville replied. He received another application requesting discharge, and this time the words had been written on it approved. So Neville persisted only in his imagination, feeling himself to be at home with his family, and with many other young men remaining in the army, Neville was honorably discharged. He knows how to persist and, and implores us to do the same. And by the way, Neville only served in the army just long enough to get through basic training. His friend, who didn't do what Neville suggested, suffered another three years in the army. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Now, and, love, and that's a challenging that story, colonel... too. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's kind of a challenging story, too, because there are a lot of people who feel very passionate about the importance of service in the military. So that, that's a story that can kind of cut the heart of, of some people. And some people are going to say, oh, well, no, that wasn't all that honorable. He shouldn't have been dishonor He shouldn't have been honorably discharged. He should have been dishonorably discharged and so forth. Just basically pointing to the fact that this is an emotionally um, driven uh, story. There, there's a lot going on with this story beyond what Neville wanted. I, I love the idea that his colonel wanted him. I'm imagining the colonel knowing a little bit about Neville's powerful mind, right. thinking, if we have this guy imagine X, Y, and Z, we can vanquish our enemies, right? We'll win the battle. <laughs> or maybe we can stop the war or whatever, right? He, uh, well, I wonder you know, where, where the colonel was. Why wasn't the colonel pushing that one? He should have been really like, pushing yeah, that one up, you know? Oh, you my goodness. You see the potential of employing uh, someone like Neville. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, now, I would think that there was something about Neville that the colonel... Um, uh, understood was honorable because he wanted him there. Mm hmm Yeah, that's true. Right? Talking about, you know, whether it was honorable or dishonorable, um, I think Neville must have proved himself to be an honorable person um, because he was highly desired to stay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, just get rid of this guy. He's trouble. <laughs> mm. So it's a, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I love Neville stories. I know there's so many of them out there. I hadn't <laughs> heard that one. I had not heard that one either. And then Allison uh, basically raised a call for help, but it, it didn't really have a question in it. She said, it is hard when you have lost your confidence. I have also aged a great deal in the last two years. And that was the extent of her comment. She didn't go into any more detail about that. But she clearly is expressing what so many of us have gone through at various times in our lives, where we do lose some confidence and we start to disbelieve and we start to doubt, and it can turn into that negative spiral. So I guess I put that out there. What, what do you think, Cindy? What can we tell to Allison to help her turn things around? Well, I, I certainly understand because we do. We have all gone through that. I yeah. think that's a common, it's a common human experience. And oh, yes. one of the things that I think is really important is to remember that, to recognize that the emotions that feel uncomfortable, <laughs> like doubt, uh, loss of confidence, when we feel hopeless, uh, unfortunately, I mean, or maybe fortunately, just knowing that those are all common, normal human experiences. And so don't beat yourself up too much about that, you know, like you're doing something wrong or you're not good enough or because that just adds more fuel to that fire. But in reality, we all experience that at times. And it's a it's like the, the dashboard light, you know, certainly it's something to pay attention to. Right. Um, and I know I had a day like that yesterday it just wasn't the best day emotionally for me. And it's one of the things that I did is I recognized that, you know what? It's a common human experience. We all go through this. I want to be aware of it. I want to still persist in what I'm creating over here. Just not real comfortable with some of the feelings that I'm having, but I'm going to feel them anyway. I'm going to know that they are serving some kind of purpose. Um, they're giving me some kind of information. And, you know, it's funny because I think the information really came today in the middle of this podcast when I recognized, oh, See, that's the thing that I want to be my default is that when I'm having those kind of thoughts and doubts and losing my confidence, 
that I can say, oh, no, here we go. I know what's happening here. I'm going to be persistent. I'm going to be persistent in this thing that I'm starting to create because, you know, I think it's just sometimes a sign that we're getting very close. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to give up before we get there. That's true. So persistence is the key. And I, I'm, you know, I want to encourage you to, to be persistent. And as far as aging goes, we've all aged a great deal in the past two years. Some of us feel like the past two years have been a hundred years long. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, aging is another thing. It happens to all of us, right? And with age comes experience and wisdom and lots of things that need to be valued greatly. So, we received I hope that a helps. we received a, a compliment yesterday. I think it was from I think it was from Siraj uh, yesterday morning when Louis de Souza and his friend Astrid Kaufman, who's the uh, uh, she doesn't like to describe herself this way, but I describe her as a Jinshin Jitsu expert. Um, we were talking about Jinshin Jitsu. We were talking about how it applies with the law of attraction. And uh, Siraj commented at one point that all three of us were looking younger. And I thought, well, that, that's really <laughs> nice. Good. Thank you very much. I mean, that's good to hear. <laughs> it sounds like I'm making some progress. That's another one of my goals in life, to feel and actually get younger in a sense, to have a younger um, body, a body that just behaves like a younger person. Um, so it goes to show our minds can actually work in both directions, and we really can turn things around. So, Allison, I, I believe that. I wouldn't give up hope, Allison, just because you may have aged – uh, more than you wanted to over the last two years doesn't mean you can't reverse that. You actually can. Absolutely. And, and I do know that what does it is feeling better. And feeling better is not something that happens to us. It's something that we choose, that we go out of our way to make it happen for ourselves by looking at you know what it's going to take for me to feel good and then getting myself into that frame of mind, whatever way I, I need to do that, which we talk about a lot here on the podcast. So don't give right. up. We also, we also can remember that we, we live in a human body that has certain needs, mm -hmm. and I know that there are different opinions about what those needs are uh, and how much of them we need, like sleep, water, healthy food, moving our body, right. um, sex. All of those things are things we need, and we need to start there. Like sometimes we go looking for the magic bullet, you know, some supplement we can take. And believe me, I'm like, I'm over here raising my hand. I have covered calling <laughs> supplements. You know, it's like I want to be, I want to be as young and youthful as I can be as well, just because it feels better to have energy and to uh, be flexible and all those things that we associate with youth, right? But start at the beginning and just check yourself and see, am I – Am I sleeping enough? Am I drinking enough water? Am I eating food that's healthy for me? Um, I read something that was interesting yesterday that reminded me of a question that we had from from someone last week. But what the the article was about was how sugar affects anxiety. Oh, wow! And it was actually it was actually um, John Gray who mm -hmm. was writing it, and he said that he. He was talking about sugar, and he was talking about those, like, vitamin drinks, like vitamin. He didn't – I don't think he was talking about the actual vitamin water drink because this was written, I think, before that was available. But he said, like, a healthy drink that has vitamins in it and it seems healthy. He talked about the amount of sugar that was in it. And then he talked about the label saying it was two and a half servings. So if you take that into consideration, it was like – it was the equivalent of – drinking a glass of water with seven teaspoons of sugar in it. Whoa. And the point that he made that I thought was kind of fascinating is that he said that when he would do public speaking, he would always have a great deal of anxiety about it. And that when he, when I don't know how he found out, but when he recognized there was a connection between sugar and anxiety, he stopped eating or drinking anything with sugar, any kind of sugar, on days where he was going to be speaking. Ah. And he said, the anxiety just left. Interesting, yeah. And I didn't know there was that connection. I know people have asked, what do you do about anxiety? And we're talking about law of attraction. And this might sound really mundane and non-magical, but I always go back to those foundational things first. Sure, yeah. Right? Well, it makes sense to me, really, because I, I, I've been in our own family here with Louise and me, I've 
I've been the person who's sounding the, the trumpet about sugar for the longest time, much to Louise's chagrin at times. Um, but right. It, I, mean, I just see it happening in a variety of different ways. Anxiety, yeah, I think I can point to having seen anxiety in my own life when I had too much sugar. And uh, I, I keep saying to myself, well, I'm going to cut it out entirely, and that doesn't quite work. So I cut it down, and I keep cutting it down, cutting it down, cutting it down. <laughs> and when I keep doing that, I do feel better. I perform better. Um, I have a lot fewer of those sugar high, sugar low situations. Um, I, I'm less likely to just kind of fall asleep at, you know, at the computer while I'm trying to do something. It's just... Well, the it, thing that I think is interesting is that, you know, Abraham says, and this is one of the things Abraham says that I just love, is that if you have the focus, if you have the ability and you've really trained yourself your mind to control your thoughts and to focus, laser focus. Yes, you probably can go to McDonald's and create a five star meal. Sure. But it's really just easier to go to a five star restaurant. Much easier. And I feel like that about this. I'm like, you know, yes, you probably can use law of attraction, get all kinds of health benefits in your body while you're still just eating total junk, sleeping for not enough time, you know, in other words, doing lots of things that are unhealthy. If someone were to ask me, well, can I still do all these things and just use law of attraction to be fit and energetic, I, I would probably say, you know, if your focus is, is good enough, probably, but it's mm. just easier to eat the right healthy food and get enough sleep and drink some water. And why not do both? <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's not like we have to choose do use it with the law of attraction or just, you know, do it by eating better. We can do both and get twice no, the benefit I think we out need of it. To use I, since since I'm co-hosting a Law of Attraction podcast, I'm definitely on board with using Law of Attraction to create health yeah. <laughs> and to create everything else. Absolutely. However, what I am saying is that there there is the there are the mundane actions, there are the normal right. human life kind of things, common sense that we also should take into Absolutely. account. Because when we use them both together, that's when we that's get powerful super results. Yeah. That's when we really tap into the power. Is we're using both of them together, and they're supporting each other instead of fighting against each exactly. other, right? Exactly. Yes, exactly. I mean, Neville talked about the three friends being, a three being a number, a picture of completion and wholeness. And I think that's what we do when we get our habits on board with law of attraction. It doesn't mm. mean we can't enjoy life. You know, I'm not going to completely say, oh, I'm never going to eat, you know, a piece of cake again because sugar is not good for me. Um that's not what I mean at all, but I'm just saying that if we can get them both on board where we're in alignment with our habits, things will absolutely superpower. We will have that power and the speed that we want. Now, Siraj also uh, asked a follow-up question, and uh, he says, "Does our pa do our past and future lives connect? Because he read an article regarding this that said that our past life and current life is connected. Okay, so you're not just talking about past like yesterday and the day before. You're talking about a past life, like before mm -hmm. an incarnation. Right. I am not an expert in that area. That's actually so a good question to ask Linda on, on Fridays. Friday, Linda is like all over this past life, current life, how everything's connected together. She's definitely the one to ask that question of. And I can tell you the there answer is going to be yes. <laughs> well, I, I, would, I would lean towards yes, and I'll tell you there's a fantastic book um, and I, I hope I don't get the title wrong. I think it was called Return from Heaven. Um, there was a scientist that did a lot of experiments but never wanted to publish them because he was not wanting to sensationalize the work, and which he would have. Um, but a lot of studies on in other countries where um, reincarnation is accepted as the normal. Mm -hmm. Here in the United States, we have a lot of, I, I believe in reincarnation, but a lot of people don't. There's a lot of resistance. And some religious yeah. systems do not, right? Right. And so, so here, and the, the point that this book was making was that many times when a child is born, they do remember things from a past life, and they will speak about them, but people will shut them down and say, oh, that's, you know, you are, you are not, you know, a cowboy silly, you know? <laughs> Whatever. I had a friend that said he had a three-year-old brother. He said, my three-year-old brother 
talked about Vietnam all the time and said that he was in Vietnam. And everybody would say, oh, my goodness, what an imagination. No, you sure were. And I'm thinking, well, how does a three year old even know that stuff? I would have a tendency to say we should listen to this kid. Right. But Absolutely. the book is a, is about is stories about um, children that have especially in other countries that have been born that have known like the names of people in other villages where they've never visited, things like that. So I would say that they're connected, yes, but I know that there are other people who wouldn't believe that. I don't know what Abraham says or what Neville says um, about it because we haven't really covered that. What do you think, Walt? Um, I, I tend to agree. I, I have my own questions as well. All I can tell you is if you want to get more specific details, again, ask Linda Armstrong on Friday because she'll give you chapter and verse about, yes, they're all connected and, and here's – how you should uh, understand it, and so on and so forth. She'll give you the whole thing, much more than I possibly can. <laughs> good so, question, oh, though. A good, very good question. Um, and also I wanted to mention uh, Deidre had a, a comment to share about the confidence. She says, I think we lose confidence when we haven't heard about who we are. Neville reminds us that we have God within each of us, that he is experiencing life through us. I personally like that idea. It's what makes me feel confident and powerful. Just to sit and imagine such a powerful being inside is a very confidence-building state of awareness to be in. So that's a good statement about confidence. Agreed. Yeah. Very good. I totally agree with that. Yes. Very good. Um, I, I want to make sure I get our messaging in, too, uh, because we haven't done that part yet. First of all, if you're not yet a subscriber to the podcast, what are you waiting for? You can tell. I mean, we have great, great discussions on these shows, and you get every single one of the episodes coming directly to your smartphone when you are a subscriber. And it's really easy to do. Um, if you can look in the description where you're seeing this, most of the places where, with, where there's a description, you'll find links for both um, Apple, iPhone, iPad users, and for Android users. Just click the one that applies in your particular case, and it'll just walk you right through the process of becoming a, a subscriber of the podcast. And then once you're a subscriber, make sure you listen to the episodes when they come through. Make sure you go to your settings to say, yes, I want to be notified whenever I, an episode comes through. And that way you can always follow up and listen to everything that's coming on that we're doing every week. We're doing 10, 11 episodes a week. And also, we want you to take a moment each time that you're listening. You're listening right now to one of our podcasts, either in live stream or as a recording. Put on social media that you're listening to it because that's how the word gets out. I know we've asked you to do that before. We want you to continue to do it because repetition makes a big difference in outreach. Um, it's, it's a kind of a truism in, in advertising circles. People who are professionals in advertising say, you got to expose people to the same message repeatedly. I think the magic number used to be six times, but I've heard you know, numbers ranging from five to 50 in terms of how many repetitions people need to hear before they finally start taking action and, and following up on whatever the message is that you're giving them. Well, that includes telling them about LOA Today and your daily dose of happy. So please keep putting out there on social media that you're listening because it really does make a difference. And after all, that's probably how you found out about LOA Today. So do a favor for somebody else. And those, Cindy, Very are good. our messages for the day. Those are our messages. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I love what just happened because I clicked over to the next chapter and it's case histories. Case and histories. the first one is the first one is the story that we were just um Oh told. my god. <laughs> Holy cow. Deidre, you're, are you following the book with us? Is that what happened? Oh, my goodness. I was like, maybe Deidre was reading ahead, uh, or maybe this is just a wonderful synchronicity. So I think, let's go ahead and read it. Yeah, uh, let's do it. <laughs> That's okay. great. So it says it will be extremely helpful at this point to cite a number of specific examples of the successful application of this law. Actual case histories are given. In each of these, the problem is clearly defined. And the way imagination was used to attain the required state of consciousness is fully described. In each of these instances, the author of this book was either personally concerned or was told the facts by the person involved. Okay. So number one, this is the first one. We may only get to the first one, but we'll see. <laughs> this is a story with every detail of which I am personally familiar, writes Neville. <laughs> <laughs> In the spring of 1943... A recently drafted soldier was stationed in a large army camp in Louisiana. He was intensely eager to get out of the army, 
but only in an entirely honorable way. The only way he could do this was to apply for a discharge. The application then required the approval of his commanding officer to become effective. Based on Army regulations, the decision of the commanding officer was final and could not be appealed. The soldier, following all the necessary procedure, applied for a discharge. Within four hours, this application was returned, marked disapproved. Convinced he could not appeal the decision to any higher authority, military or civilian, he turned within to his own consciousness, determined to rely on the law of assumption. The soldier realized that his consciousness was the only reality, that his particular state of consciousness determined the events he would encounter. That night, in the interval between getting into bed and falling asleep, he concentrated on consciously using the law of assumption. In imagination, he felt himself to be in his own apartment in New York City. He visualized his apartment, that is, in his mind's eye, he actually saw his own apartment, mentally picturing each one of the familiar rooms with all the furnishings vividly real. With this picture clearly visualized and lying flat on his back, he completely relaxed physically. In this way, he induced a state bordering on sleep, at the same time retaining control of the direction of his attention. When his body was completely immobilized, he assumed that he was in his own room and felt himself to be lying in his own bed, a very different feeling from that of lying on an army cot. In imagination, he rose from the bed, walked from room to room, touching various pieces of furniture. He then went to the window and with his hands resting on the sill, looked out on the street on which his apartment faced. So vivid was all this in his imagination that he saw in detail the pavement, the railings, the trees, and the familiar red brick of the building on the opposite side of the street. He then returned to his bed and felt himself drifting off to sleep. He knew that it was most important in the successful use of this law that at the actual point of falling asleep, his consciousness be filled with the assumption that he was already what he wanted to be. All that he did in imagination was based on the assumption that he was no longer in the army. Night after night, the soldier enacted this drama. Night after night, in imagination, he felt himself honorably discharged back in his home, seeing all the familiar surroundings and falling asleep in his own bed. This continued for eight nights. For eight days, his objective experience continued to be directly opposite to his subjective experience in consciousness each night before going to sleep. On the ninth day, orders came through from battalion headquarters for the soldier to fill out a new application for his discharge. Shortly after this was done, he was ordered to report to the colonel's office. During the discussion, the colonel asked him if he was still desirous of getting out of the army. Upon receiving an affirmative reply, the colonel said that he personally disagreed, and while he had strong objections to approving of the discharge, he had decided to overlook these objections and to approve it. Within a few hours, the application was approved, and the soldier, now a civilian, was on a train bound for home. <laughs> this is interesting. This is an interesting story for two reasons. One, because he doesn't actually identify himself as the soldier. He hints at it really, really strongly, but he doesn't right. actually identify himself, which is fascinating <laughs> and is not terribly surprising because of what I alluded to earlier, because there's so much resistance to the idea of, well, you know, you can't try to opt out. There, uh, anybody who's ever been a conscientious objector is vilified, thrown in prison, for goodness sake. So, you know, I can understand why he wasn't saying, jumping up and down saying, well, this was me, this was me. Right. Well, two things stood out for me. The first one was that, kind of like our discussion earlier about health and about habits, mm -hmm. is that he put the application in. Yes. Right. He, he, he took all the mundane actions that one would take mm -hmm. if they didn't know about these processes, if right. they didn't know how to work magic, if they didn't know how to use law of attraction and the law of assumption. He just did what anyone would do. How do I get out? Well, I have to make this application. So he did those things. And I think that's important to remember Absolutely. that it's okay to take the normal actions that someone would take. Um, I like the idea of make a plan that works without 
magic and then point your magic wand at the plan, right? <laughs> so that's kind of what he did here. Exactly. Um, and then the other thing that really stood out was where he says that his experience, you know, for eight days, his objective experience continued to be directly opposite Yes. To his subjective experience and yes. consciousness each night. I agree. So even though he was assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, his experience throughout the day was directly opposite of having achieved that. So there wasn't a whole lot of evidence going on to say, hey, it's working, right? <laughs> but he was persistent. So exactly. Exactly I think right. it's a really great story. Yeah. I'm so glad we got to hear it twice today. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? And Deidre actually said she she actually had not been following along in the book. So this was just pure so serendipity <laughs> going on. Pure synchronicity. Well, when that happens, I always pay attention, right? When you hear a message more than once <laughs> over a period, it's like, okay, we need to pay attention to this. Exactly. So, uh, so exactly. Thank you so much for, for chiming in because it gives us a, an idea that we really need to be persistent. It really does. And that persistence peace is exactly what I was thinking about when I was talking earlier about that little video vignette I created for myself. Because I, I, that's why I wanted to put it into a loop. I wanted to turn it into something I could just keep playing over, over and over and again over and, over. And, and you know just doing everything I could to get myself into that feeling place and staying there. Because that's my goal. My goal really is to stay yeah. there and, and, and just just believe in my mind that's what's actually going on. Because I know when that happens, that's when the hardening takes place. That's when it hardens into reality. Right. That's right. Yay! It's exciting. <laughs> it is. It's fun. It's kind of an experiment too, you know, to see how is it, how does this actually work in my life. I'm well, okay. I'm finding out. I'm I'm applying it. Well, it's one of those things we most of us should have already learned this a long time ago, right? Like when we're little kids, we go to school and we learn things by repetition. That's true. And we memorize poems and we learn multiplication tables even at a really young age like mm -hmm. by repeating it over and over yep and so it makes sense it does that's true it makes sense that we want to be persistent and uh, i love the video idea yeah now the only tricky part of course is finding a video that's appropriate for for whatever it is you're trying to attract right um in, in my case um <laughs> i literally put it out there i typed out there into youtube <laughs> I said, I'm I'm trying to attract something using the law of attraction. Show me something. I mean, literally, I was typing it like that, and this is what came up. Perfect. <laughs> well, when when Neville was talking about, because we always we've been talking about, and it's his idea to make the vignette short. But when mm -hmm. reading this story, um, he was talking about quite a long vignette. It was I mean, pretty involved. Wandering yeah. through his apartment, he's touching the furniture, he's looking at each room. Um, and so I started thinking about someone who has trouble visualizing. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is where, like you said, vision boards and videos come in. Like, yeah. you don't have to do this work with your eyes closed if that's not what works for you. Like, find a way to, to see it. Exactly. Because yeah. I already know that my I, I have this limitation. And, yes, I know every time I say I have this limitation, I reinforce it. But the fact is I've been dealing with it for some time. And I need a way to continue to... Uh, attract anyway, and I have successfully attracted without being able to visualize. So, um, I am going to start telling a, a new story of how I am learning to visualize. I'm getting better at it. I'm actually practicing it. Um, I've been practicing. I, I tried practicing seeing scenes, and I really wasn't getting anywhere with that. So I started a new approach. I just started trying to visualize blue. Like, could I see blue in my mind, like a blue sky, that kind of a thing? And I've actually had a little bit of success. Not a lot. But a little bit. So I figure if I keep persisting at that, maybe I can keep building go. myself up to, <laughs> I can, to the point where I can visualize. Wouldn't that be cool? Perfect. So we are unfortunately running out of time here, but uh, fortunately we got like seven or eight, I don't know how many uh, case history stories to read to, um, tomorrow morning. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I'm excited about that. Yeah. They always fire me up. Yes. Absolutely. Amp up your faith. That's so. how we do it. Please do join us uh, tomorrow and for all of our episodes as well. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.